six, four, three, three, eight, eight, eight. Good afternoon, three. everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for our 35th annual celebration of Pi Day. Give it up. This is not only a special anniversary for us, a special annual celebration, but this is the first time that we're getting to celebrate Pi Day, our beloved homegrown holiday invented by staff member Larry Shaw in 1988. It's the first time we get to do it back in person with our community uh, since 2019. I don't need to remind anybody of what happened between those times, but it's needless to say we're thrilled to have you all back at, here in person and you tuning in at home. Um, we're glad to be broadcasting this again to the world to share some of our perspective on Pi. So those of you here in the museum, you're going to get a chance today to catch this wonderful program where we're weaving the art and science of Pi and all of its wonderful metaphors that can exist in our minds. And as a treat, since you're here in person, at 1.59 p.m., we'll kick off our annual procession of Pi, parade around the museum, and line up for a free slice of Pie, in case you didn't catch that at home. So those of you tuning in at home or wherever you are, I hope that you have your own way of celebrating Pie Day, drawing circles, spinning around, making a dance, eating pie. However you celebrate pie is welcome to us. Um, today's program is really special. This year, we've, we've invited an artist in residency with us to be a part of our Pie Day celebrations. Math artist John Sims has been doing work on pie for over 20 years. Uh, I came late to the party and learning about his work, but learned that it, he has created a Pi Day anthem. That's what we just heard as you were walking in, and that's what we're going to march to today. But in addition to the incredible music and composition he makes based on Pi, he also does three-dimensional objects. Right now here at the Exploratorium, we have two of his quilts, which are hand-sewn with a group of Amish quilters in Sarasota, Florida, that are inspired by Pi. So if you have a chance to come to the Pier 15, before the end of March, you can see those pie quilts in person. John Sims has been an incredible collaborator with us this year on Pi Day. He really embodies our spirit of making learning accessible and bringing in new ideas and ways of thinking about this. If you have a chance as well, I encourage you to check out um, an incredible op-ed that he wrote in the Tampa Bay Times about the inclusivity of pie and why pie should be for everyone. I think you'll get some flavors of that uh, with his performance today. So just to set the stage, we're going to open the program with a poem. We're going to learn more about Pi. John Sims himself will read one of his uh, pieces around Pi. And we're going to have a musical performance. You might see that there's some instruments behind me. It's not just a tease. They will be played with the incredible science band interpreting one of John's compositions. Then we're going to see how Pi applies to our current science and how Pi can even take us to Mars. Then we're going to wrap up with one more final poem and get ready to eat some pie. You folks in the house, are you all ready to get this started? Yeah. All right. Let me welcome up our first performer of the afternoon. This is Kim Shuck. She's self-described as a silly protein. She is the seventh poet laureate of San Francisco Emerita, solo author of eight books, and a longtime fan of whimsical numbers. Please help me welcome to the stage Kim Shuck. I knew it was going to trip on that. Thank you. Pi, periphery, analyzing the infinite. The grass dancer dances down a space for circles so that we can begin. Pi, how fine a precision is needed. How many decimal places in the curves of daily life. How fine for the extraordinary, for the transcendental. Pi, a tool for describing ellipses, cones, spheres, circles, and things that behave like circles, or low polygons that roll like wheels. Pi, a tool for describing the curves of the universe. We are each a center point for spheres that touch, avoid, intersect, can diagram like 3D Venn, a particular logic. Pi a way to find the circles hidden in the equations, the every equations around, surrounding, sounding harmonic progressions. Pi, the plaything of Klein and Euler, but also every basket weaver who starts with a square and plates finding themselves finally encircled. Every ceramicist spinning clay, every child with a compass or plastic wheels and a pen. Pi, to be rope skipped, 
memorized, multiplied, recoded into words, into quilts, and even into fruit and crust. Pi electric, pi magnetic, pi along the arch neck of a fractal, pi in the column that holds up other temples, in Dido's ox hide, pi visible and invisible in the gears that run our understanding of here, of now, pi a fish moving through salt water just there in the bay, pi the river finding level in wandering, pi in potential witches and wonders, in prime numbers, in approximations and specifications, pi calling us all to come play, study, explore. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. What a wonderful meditation and way to welcome us to this celebration. It really is a homegrown holiday. Uh, 35 years ago, Larry Shaw, as I mentioned at the top, had the idea to create culture around Pi. Pi has been used for countless millennia by people, whether it's been defined as a number or not, but in how we shape things, how we see the world, how we appreciate circles. And it was with the Exploratorium staff that Larry Shaw gathered people in a circle, of course, to kind of start to celebrate that number. And I'm in awe of how the celebration has blossomed from there. Um, on a personal note, my very first day working at the Exploratorium was Pi Day, and I got to take a photo with Larry Shaw. <laughs> so being back here to celebrate it all really feels like coming full circle. Sorry about that. Um, but why Pi? Who knows what Pi is? You may have some ideas, but here to give you the complete story is our longtime staff member over 50 years, our expert educator, Ron Hipschman. Welcome to the stage, Ron. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Let me just, I have to walk behind here, so let's just. Welcome, everybody, to Pi Day. Yay! This, amazingly, is the 35th annual Pi Day. It's also Einstein's birthday. Yay! So happy birthday, Albert. We take the whole idea of Einstein's famous tongue photo very seriously on Pi Day. So, uh, so do the Swiss, actually. I'm going to take my mask off here. There we go, that's much better. The Swiss, in, in 2020, the Swiss Mint issued a three millimeter diameter, eighth inch diameter, gold coin of Albert, with Albert Einstein's face on it. That famous photo, actually. Uh, it's the smallest gold coin in the world, actually. It has a face value of a quarter Swiss franc, which is about 26 cents, uh, as a gold coin. Unfortunately, only a thousand of them were made. And even though we have the Swiss consulate over on Pier 17 as our wonderful tenants, I was unable to get, a, uh, get one for myself, but they were 199 francs to buy, which is about $70. So it's not a good deal buying a $70 coin that's only worth 26 cents. At least it's, I don't think that's a good investment. So I, but I still wish I had had one. This whole tongue thing, again, is uh, our previous director, couldn't avoid the notorious tongue photo. Uh, nor could your favorite pet resist emulating Einstein. Or one of my fellow staff members' kids. Or my very good friend and astronomy professor Benjamin with his longest COVID hair. Of course, his hair was just trying to emulate who? Larry Shaw, who's the founder and inventor of Pi Day way back in 1988. And this day is a tribute to him and his life. Uh, Pi Day has a really nice Wikipedia page. So, and there you can see Larry, our Prince of Pi. Catherine, his wife is here somewhere. I don't know, where is she? Oh, she there she is, she's back, she's wearing the shirt, the, the Pi shirt, of course. There she is, yeah. Please support Wikipedia. Larry built and placed the original pie shrine in the, on the mezzanine of the Palace of Fine Arts uh, back when, it was, uh, uh, when the Exploratorium was in the Palace of Fine Arts. He placed it in the middle of a round classroom 
and that round classroom was made out of round cinder blocks. So it was a really appropriate place for the pie shrine to, to end up. When we moved here to Pier 15, we dedicated a brand new pie shrine, and this one is on the public plaza in front of the museum. Uh, be sure to visit it. If you participate in our pie procession later on, we will be headed off to the pie shrine, and we will circumambulate it 3.14 times while singing happy birthday to Albert Einstein. We hope you come in. We hope you're gonna participate in the pie parade. Pi Day, of course. We celebrated on March 14th at 1.59, so that would be 3.14 at 1.59. Let's get rid of all that punctuation, and of course we end up with pi, or at least a very good approximation of pi. Sometimes at the Exploratorium, we also celebrate 2 Pi Day. 2 Pi Day is, of course, 2 times pi, which uh, would be on June 28th at 3.18, because uh, that's 6.28, which is 2 pi, 6.28. Now when we're feeling really, really silly, we celebrate 3 pi day. 3 times pi is 9.424778, and you realize that that, then we have to celebrate on 942, which would be a September 42nd. Well, of course you have to carry the extra 12 days into October, so it's actually on October 12th. Now, that's in the US, in Europe, they can't celebrate Pi Day. They can only celebrate Pi Approximation Day because instead of doing month day, they do day month. Pi Approximation Day is the 22nd of July, which was 22.7, which many of you are going to recognize as a approx good approximation of Pi. 22 sevenths is 3.14285. That's really good. It's good to four hundredths of a percent. So that's pretty good. So what about pi? We all know one of the most common places where pi shows up is in the famous formula for calculating the circumference of a circle. If you know the diameter, the circumference, how far around, is equal to pi times the diameter, how far across. Or in shorthand, we can write c is equal to pi times d. Now if you take that formula and move things around, you can see that Pi is just the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, and that's true for any circle, no matter its size, and we'll be doing more of that. Let's look at some examples of that. For instance, let's start with this beautiful pizza, um, and let, we have to throw in some pepperonis here as well. Um, and you will notice here that if this pizza is seven pepperonis across, how many pepperonis around will it be? Well, you probably already know because I gave you the approximation. If it's seven pepperonis across, you would notice that it was 22 pepperonis around. And we all know that 22 sevenths is a good approximation for pi. The circumference to the diameter, in this case 22 sevenths, is approximately pi, really good, to within four hundredths of a percent. And we're again, again, this circumference to diameter ratio equaling pi is the same for all pizzas, all circles too. We've heard that pi is irrational. But what does that mean? It means a few things. First, you cannot write pi as the ratio of two integers. Now, I've already given you an example of that, uh, our pi approximation, 22 sevenths. That's the ratio of two integers, and that is not irrational. It's rational because it's a, it's a, it's a fraction. Uh, next, an irrational number has an infinite number of digits. Well, 22 sevenths does have an infinite number of digits, but it fails a, a test, a third test for irrationality, and that it doesn't settle into an inf it doesn't settle into an infinitely repeating pattern. And you can see here that look real carefully, and you'll notice that 22 sevenths does repeat. So there's an infinitely repeating pattern in that, whereas pi is infinitely non-repeating. There's an infinite number of digits in pi, and it never repeats. Seems almost impossible, doesn't it? That's why it's irrational, I guess. Pi never repeats. You've also heard that pi is transcendental, and I don't want to go too, too far into that because it's a little 
uh, is a little bit too mathematical, but a transcendental number is a number that is not algebraic, meaning that you, it's not the solution of any finite series of algebraic operations. Well, let's just forget that. Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's look at pi through history. If you look at Wikipedia's page on the chronology of the computation of pi, you're going to find 112 record-breaking computations. We don't have time to explore all of them. So let's just take a look at a few of uh, some selected bits, okay? In Egypt, 2600 BCE, pi was declared to be 22 sevenths, our great approximation. And they got quite far with that approximation. It's, again, good to four hundredths of a percent. We move forward to 700 years later in Babylonia, around 1900 BCE, and they uh, used 25 eighths as their version of pi. Again, it's only half a percent too small. Still not bad. We move forward uh, another 1300 years at the time the Bible was written, around 600 BCE, and we find a value of pi in the text of Kings chapter seven. It says, and he, Hiram, made a molten sea, 10 cubits from one rim to the other, and it was round all about, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. Okay, 10 cubits diameter, 30 cubits circumference. What does that make pi equal to? Three. Still not too bad, it's good within 5%, but we're kind of losing accuracy here. So let's move on to where we're actually beginning to calculate pi instead of just measuring it. By the way, there's some really great activities going on here where you can measure pi, so be sure to participate in those. Archimedes came up with a brilliant geometrical method to calculate pi about 400 years after the biblical times there. He uh, used polygons. You can accurately uh, calculate the area of a polygon because you can break any polygon up into triangles. And it's easy to calculate the area of a triangle, especially if you know the Pythagorean theorem. Now Archimedes drew a circle so that it just fit inside the polygon. So the polygon was circumscribed around the circle. Uh, he drew another similar polygon, so this one has six sides. He, in this case, he would have drew, drawn another six-sided hexagon inside the circle, so just fit inside the circle, an inscribed and a circumsci circumscribed uh, polygon. Now, he understood that the area of the circle falls somewhere between the areas of the bigger polygon and the smaller polygon. So if you can calculate the two areas, you can sort of narrow in on the area of the circle. And he knew that the area of the circle is pi r squared. So if you can figure out the area and you can measure the radius, you can figure out pi. Um, let's move on. He also realized that if you have more sides in your polygon, the closer it comes to the size of the circle, the more sides the polygon has, the closer the inscribed and circumscribed polygons come to the actual circle. Well, he said, hmm, let me see if how many sides I can calculate and I can get as close as I can. And he used a 96-sided polygon and he was able to determine that pi was somewhere between 3.141 and 3.143. That's really good, not bad, but 96 sides, that's impressive. Let's move a little bit East, we're going to move to China. Zhang Heng, in 130 AD, declared that pi was the square root of 10, good to a tenth of a percent. He got a postage stamp, eventually, obviously not in 130 AD, um, but he did get a postage stamp for his efforts. Moving to India, Madhava of Sangha Magrama in 1400 AD calculated pi to 11 digits. Now we're getting some real accuracy. Moving to Persia, present-day Iran, Jamshid al-Kashi in 1424 calculated pi to 16 digits. He also got a postage stamp for his effort. Well, eventually got a postage stamp for his efforts. 
Moving a little further, Ludolf von Kuhlen, a German Dutch mathematician, spent most of his life calculating pi to 35 digits. Using essentially the same method as Archimedes, except whereas Archimedes stopped with the 96 gone, Ludolf had 2 to the 62 sides. That's a lot of sides for a polygon. Uh, that's actually about 4.6 quintillion sides. Incidentally, 35 digits of pi is way more than enough to calculate anything anyone could possibly use. We'll have a little more on that later. After his death, that number was actually called the Ludafine number, um, and it was engraved on his tombstone. He spent most of his life calculating it. That tombstone was unfortunately lost, but, uh, but it was restored in the year 2000, and this is a picture of the new uh, Kulin tombstone. So the first to use the Greek letter pi as a symbol for the number was this fellow, William Jones, in 1706, and he took that first letter from the Greek word perimetros, meaning perimeter, uh, and that's where we, that's how we use the, the letter pi to symbolize this uh, constant. Now we're going to move way forward. John von Neumann in 1949 calculated pi to 2037 digits. He did that with a computer, the one of the very first digital computers that took 70 hours of computer time on this computer, the ENIAC, or Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer. By the way, uh, your current phone, like my phone here, has four processors in it. This had 18,000 vacuum tubes, by the way. My phone here has four processors in it, and each one of those four processors is 640,000 times as fast as that computer. I digress. Moving to 1958, Francois Jean-Louis calculated pi to 10,000 digits in 1.7 hours using this IBM 704 computer. And let's, in the modern era, the first, uh, first million digits were calculated in 1973, the first billion digits in 1989, 1.2 trillion digits in 2002, 2.7 trillion in 2009, 13 trillion in 2014, and 22 trillion in 2016. But that's not the end of the story, of course. I want to introduce a couple of the personalities involved here. On Pi Day 2019, Emma Haruka Iwaho and the Pi calculating team at Google computed Pi to 31.4 trillion digits. 31.4 trillion. And on January 29th, unfortunately not Pi Day, on January 29th, 2020, Timothy Mulliken, on a computer he built himself, calculated Pi to 50 trillion digits. His calculation took 303 days and cost about $10,000. Google spent $200,000. It's all right. Here's Tim's home computer that he calculated it on. It's maybe a bit more extensive than most of our home computers. So if we add Emma and Timothy to the list, doesn't quite complete it. Um, Last year, 2021, pi was calculated to almost 63 trillion digits. Um, that was by the, uh, uh, by the University of Applied Science of East Switzerland. And I want you to notice a couple of things here. Uh, take a look at the, uh, carefully at Emma's number of digits. You notice anything here? Three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six. Four. Yeah. Emma calculated pi to pi to the 13th digit, pi times 10 to the 13th digits. But notice also that the University of uh, Swi East Switzerland, 6, 2, 8, 3, 1, they calculated pi to 2 pi times 10 to the 13th digits. <laughs> There's a reason for those seemingly random numbers. 
If we plot the number of digits calculated through time, here's what we get. By the way, I want you to note this graph here is a, for the math people out there, is a, is a log chart. Every square you move up, you multiply by 100. It's not linear. But if we look up until about 1950, the number of calculated digits grew kind of slowly. Why? Because it all had to be done by hand. After 1950, well, it got a lot faster because we were using the digital computer. But how much accuracy do we really need? 30, 63 trillion digits of pi, that's a lot of pi. How much do we really want, need to do anything practical? Well, let's take an example. Voyager 1, which was launched in 1977, is the farthest human-made object from Earth, and it's the first spacecraft to reach interstellar space beyond the influence of the sun. Well, beyond the solar wind, anyway. Right now, it's about four and a half billion miles away, moving at about 38,000, oops, <laughs> moving about 38,000 miles per hour. That's uh, pretty fast. It's one of the fastest human objects as well. Well, NASA uses 15 digits of pi to calculate the spacecraft position, all spacecraft positions. Um, that gives NASA an accuracy of plus, for Voyager, gives it an accuracy of plus or minus one and a half inches in its position. Only 15 digits of pi. Remember that Jamshid al-Kashi calculated pi to 17 digits in 1424. Let's try another example here. Take the entire universe. We have a pretty good figure, actually, for the diameter of the known universe. Let's say we wanted to calculate the circumference of the entire universe with an accuracy of plus or minus the diameter of a hydrogen atom. That's pretty accurate for such a large thing. And I guess the universe being everything would be a large thing. So the hydrogen atom is really small. It's 53 picometers, 53 trillionths of a meter in diameter. So for that kind of accuracy, how many digits of pi do we need? Well, we have to go to our old, old friend, the formula here. We need pi to an accuracy of only 39 digits. Pretty amazing. Pi has found its way into popular culture. It started here. It was just a little gathering at the Exploratorium in 1988. But in 2009, it was first declared National Pi Day by an act of Congress. Let's take a listen. House Resolution 224, resolution supporting the designation of Pi Day and for other purposes. And then they're going to vote. On this vote, the yeas are 391, the nays 10. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the resolution is agreed to. So I want to ask that question. Who would vote no on Pi Day? I just happen to have a list of them. <laughs> you remember Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other? Well, they're all like each other. Um, yes. Kind of demonstrate there was, may have been a political divide even back in 2009. Uh, by the way, none of those no voters are in office anymore. <laughs> That's what you get for voting no on Pi Day. Aside from Pi Day, Pi has found its way into other pop popular culture places in Hollywood. Here, this episode of Star Trek, an alien being had invaded the computer of the Enterprise, and Spock has a way to keep it busy. Ready. Implement. Computer, this is a Class A compulsory directive. Compute to the last digit the value of pi. As we know, the value of pi is a transcendental figure without resolution. The computer banks will work on this problem to the exclusion of all else until we order it to stop. Yes, I should keep that thing busy for a while. Yes, even got into Star Trek, the original series. There's also a rather disturbing movie about pi. I don't know if anybody has seen this movie, Pi. It's a kind of a psychological... Uh, it's crazy movie, yes. Uh, made in 1998. Uh, don't watch it with the kids. 
Well, what if you want to memorize digits of pi? I have on my, around my neck here uh, a pi medallion, and this is a silicon chip right here. And on this chip, there's a million digits of pi. That's the only way I could ever carry around that many digits of pi. They're very small. You can't see them. But in memorizing pi, pop, this is a popular activity. This fellow, Rajesh Mina, he memorized and recited 70,000 digits of pi on March 21st, 2015. It took him nine hours and 27 minutes to uh, recite that. There's a, uh, in the 2006, uh, another fellow, Akira Haraguchi, rec a retired Japanese engineer, claimed to have recited 100,000 digits, a little bit more, but it was never, the claim was never verified, unfortunately. But we want to give him credit for uh, even if it wasn't verified. So what tricks can you use to help remember pi? Well, a useful trick is called pi philology, or pilish. And w when you do this, you make up a piece of text where the number of letters in each word help you remember the digits of pi. So here's a sentence that'll help you remember pi to a NASA accuracy of 15 digits. Notice that the number of characters of each word, how I need a drink, alcoholic in nature, after the heavy lectures involving quantum mechanics, first word has three letters, second word has one letter, third word has four, three, one, four, one, five, nine, and so on. Pilish. Well, Mike Keith, who's a friend of the Exploratorium and a master of this kind of thing, which is called constrained writing. Constrained writing in this sense is writing with certain numbers of characters. Another example of constrained writing might be doing a novel without the letter E. That's a constrained writing. He uh, paraphrased Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven to use the first 740 digits of pi. I only have the first part of it here. Uh, this is also, by the way, called a pium. Uh, but this was just the beginning for Mike. Here he is in front of his computer with the first thousand digits of pi. Mike also wrote an entire book called Not a Wake. Get it? Three, one, four. Um, this book uses the first 10,000 digits of pi, and the inside is all kinds of different prose. In, there's poems, there's Po prose, is crossword puzzles. Every possible way you could put English words together is in this book. I found a couple other good books about pi, but they're not pilish. In case anybody wants some good kids books, <coughs> this one is Sir Comference and the Dragon of Pi, and Sir Comference and the Round Table. Excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> We're also big on Paiku, which is really haiku with the familiar five, seven, five syllable form, but it has to be about pi. <clears throat> here is Paul Doherty, one of our wonderful uh, teachers here. Uh, a circumference, divide by diameter, irrational pi. One from Robert Foss, Pi Day's my birthday, can I get free admission? Spent my cash on rent. He wanted to come to Pi Day really bad. <clears throat> or one more from our own Ken Finn. Best pizza value can be found with this number. Make mine with mushrooms. There's also, of course, Pi Limericks. I like this one specifically. This is my favorite one. If inside a circle a line hits the center and goes spine to spine, and the line's length is D, the circumference will be d times 3.14159. Now you too will begin seeing pi everywhere, like these M&Ms I found. They aren't incomplete M's, I'm sure. They're actually pies, <laughs> aren't they? Yes. From the entire staff of the Exploratorium, including Larry Shaw, the founder of Pi Day, we'd like to wish you all a happy Pi Day. Thank you, Ron. Is that my walk-in music there? Is it ever going to end? It never ends, just like Pi. This goes down. It's called a shepherd tone, in case anybody's interested. Ooh, now I'm getting hungry, but don't you worry. The Pi will be coming soon at the magic time of 1.59 p.m. Thanks again so much for all that, Ron. Um, always learn something. A lot of great Pi facts, but it's funny. The one thing that I was surprised by, that you said it's Einstein's birthday? 
He's, so he's a real person. I was always told he was a theoretical physicist. Okay. Tough crowd. It's Pi Day. Come on, put on a smile. Um, thank you so much. So, one thing you might have noticed about Ron's talk is that Pi is a lot to contain. It takes thousands of dollars, lots of hours, and a lot of explaining to actually get to the end of what, not the end, but to continue saying all its digits. And that transcendental nature that is kind of hard to explain is a space in thinking about Pi where I feel like the art can come in, that there are, are other ways of understanding Pi and its transcendental nature. It's not just about the digits. And that's why I'm really glad to welcome to the stage next John Sims, who has been with us for the last two weeks in residency, hanging his quilts, putting his art up, and sharing many of his wonderful works with our visiting public. And today is no exception. You will see two pieces from John. The first, he will come and recite a letter to Pi. And then following that, he'll introduce Science Band, who will perform their own version of John's Pi composition. He'll talk more about that later. But you all like music, right? It's OK. Um, well, please help me welcome to the stage the guest of honor, Mr. John Sims. Ohio, I was too excited. John Sims is a Detroit native, Sarasota-based conceptual artist, writer, and activist who creates art and curatorial projects spanning the areas of installation, performance, text, music, film, and large-scale activism. Informed by mathematics, design, and the politics of white supremacy, sacred symbols and anniversaries, and poetic political text. John Sims also has a show up at Medicine for Nightmares, a gallery bookshop in the Mission here in San Francisco. It's kind of a sister show here because he's got another one of his pie quilts there. I encourage you all to check it out with the same enthusiasm and a little bit more. Please help welcome to the stage, Mr. John Sims. Let's give it up to Sam in the Exploratorium. All right. So I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to, I got some quilts over here where I tried to visualize Pi. So I'm going to wrote a letter to Pi. I want to read that letter. Can I do that? Yeah. OK. Dear Pi, I'm one of your biggest fans. And I wanted to reach out to you today about a few things that's been on my mind lately. But first, I want to thank you for your invaluable service in the areas of mathematics, science, engineering, design, numerology, and even art. Also, I want to thank your mother, the circle, a divine gift of nature for giving birth to you. As an emissary of the sacred geometry of the universe, as a representative for visual and conceptual perfection, as a metaphor for time, rhythm, democracy, and spiritual consciousness, the circle, your mother, is one of our most celebrated forms. Either as an object of the mathematician's mind or living on the edges of the moon, the circle is simply beautiful and beautifully simple. And when we divide his spine into his outer body, we get something constant and magically special. The birth of you, 3.14159, on and on and on, a non-repeating, never-ending, irrational number endowed with the enormous complexity and capacity to capture the imagination and spirit of a curious mind in search of truth and beauty. I must admit, I wish you were simple like the circle that spawned you. Why can't you be a normal fraction like 22 over 7 or, one, or, or 355 over 113, which are great approximations? Why must you be so non-repeating? Why must you go on and on? Perhaps a better question is, why are we so driven to know you, approximate you, and calculate and capture you so completely? Like the Greeks before me, I've tried to understand you through the intersecting lenses of mathematics and art. I've tried to witness your inner workings. I've sought to square you, visualize you, color you, and hear your musical voice in search of understanding the essence of your nature. I've translated you, quilted you, and even tried to make money off of you. I have searched for patterns in you, in search of clues, metaphors, and some reflection of myself in you. I've tried to Americanize you and African-Americanize you too. How arrogant of me, so American of me, to project my identities onto you. But please don't take offense. I'm just looking for a sense 
of inspiration or perhaps a place of sanctuary from a social political reality that might be just as irrational and never ending as you. Every March 14th, also known as Pi Day, people all over the world celebrate you. The celebration started in 1988 at the Exploratorium, a science museum in San Francisco. In 2009, Pi Day was, on, was honored with a special resolution from the United States Congress as a national holiday. Now, how cool is that? On Pi Day, we recite your digits, eat pizza and pies, and walk in parades, and some get lost in your mystery. I've even created a Pi Day anthem and a collection of pie quilts I did with Amish quilters. I know all of this may seem very silly, but it's fun for kids and hip for math and science geeks and an invitation to all to reflect on the, and celebrate the role of mathematics in understanding and expressing our physical reality and material culture. Now it's clear to me why you're so special. You are not to be captured, ever. You're completely free from the bondage of systemic patterns and finiteness. And in the spirit of justice, the digits of your expansion appear with even frequency. No class of digits has preference. Your entirety is your pattern and story, only to be seen from the point of infinity. To be so free, yet so connected to the divinity of your mother, the circle, is a supreme blessed nature, nature a supreme blessed signature of nature. I hope that we humans and all of our beautiful diversity and complicated conflicts and shifting power dynamics take note of this and the never-ending quest for harmony and oneness in the collective circle of life. Thank you from a math artist. Thank you. So, um, so the quilts uh, you will see called Seeing Pi is based on base 10. You know, we sort of count powers of 10. And then there's another quote next to it called Civil Pi Movement, which is based, which is constructed from, on the diagonals, uh, pay, uh, quotes um, based on base two, zeros and ones, like a digital dynamic. And then there's base three, right? You can count powers of three. So that one's done in red, white, and blue, and that's American Pi. And then we have black, red, and green. Black pie, African American pie. That's what's up, right? Yeah, that's what's up. So, but you can also take pie and recount it in base seven. Now, why would I do that? Because maybe I want to map that into the key of B flat and get some blues popping. So, I create these pie notes that are mapped into the key of B flat, and then if you do some musical stuff. So I've invited various musicians over, over the years to create their own arrangement. So today we're gonna to have a really awesome mix arrangement presentation of my pie notes and we'll bring to the stage the science band. <laughs>
Band. Thank you. Give it up for Science Band. That's the transcendental nature I'm talking about. I could agree with that forever. Science Band will be playing a second set here today at 2.30 p.m. For those of you visiting us here at Pier 15, you can see a full performance of their own design right here at 2.30. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move back to some of our poets. We're going to welcome back to the stage Kim Shuck. And in addition, she will be joined by Sylvia Blaylock. And this is another welcome homecoming because Sylvia was once an explainer here at the Exploratorium, an explainer who worked while Frank Oppenheimer, the founder of the Exploratorium, was still here with us. So she has a deep, direct connection to this museum, and I know that she cares about Pi. Um, so please help me welcome back to the stage uh, Kim Shuck. And, and I'm not going to forget to read your bio this time. Sylvia, she's a San Francisco native and former explainer. She's the author of Uprising, a book of poetry, and founder of Queendom Network. Her latest project is Voices That Carry, Being Loud on Purpose. Welcome to the stage, Sylvia and Kim. If you're not familiar with Dr. Desiree Whitmore, who works here, um, PhD, please get to know her. She's Laser Chick on Instagram. Ready? Mm -hmm. Laser Chick, Three. Dr. Desiree Whitmore, Point. didn't see the pattern in thus. One. Square pie for Four. a round day. One. 16th letter kind of spent a copita making square pie Nine. proof that there is at least 3.1415-ish times the reaction. Five. Proof. Three that there is more Five, to just going around. Eight, those steps taken the nine, long way around, if it indeed does seven, go around, then those steps nine, taken straight across and thus three, straight through it, to it. Two, and that this isn't always three, about circles. You see, eight, pi is four, constant, but that makes it no six, less irrational. Two, that pi is thus six, makes pi transcendental. Four, Sweet 16 in the Greek, pie goes on and on and on. When it's all said and done, what comes around goes around. 3.14159265358979323238466ish more times than it comes across. Nine. Then if you're so inclined or have a mind to take the direct approach through. Eight. Three. To write one, by hand the four, calculated arcs one, and there, rising over the water five, tower, over the lit radio nine, tower, they rise two, one at a time. Six, Mars, five, Uranus, Jupiter, three, planet after planet, five, sketching curve after curve, eight, the light at dawn nine, bending through the atmosphere, seven, each soap bubble galaxy surface. Writhing three, with colors, a reflection two, from the nearest star, three, light radiating from the eight, center, overfilled four, water leaning perfectly six, over the lip of glass, two, tight tango foot, six, a half moon tracing an echo four, on the floor, the loops and spin three, of mazurka, a ballet three, toe compass in the air. Eight, we celebrate in circles. Three, we are the scaling repetition. Two, these bridges lifting in arcs. Seven, the tree shadow root and crown in circles. Nine, fog dial in the angle side. Time speaking curves. Each raindrop zero, pulled smeared spheres in the wind. Hanging two, worlds from cupped flower eight, when the rain stops. The glass eight, blowers bubble, drop, four, spin. Marble sight, One. spun of reflective Nine. thread, a sphere smelling Seven. of orange peel, singing chemicals, One. cloud spheres, and calling sunset. Nine. Again, the Three. curved song through air, Nine. back to the beginning curve, the planets Nine. rise and fall, the Three. nighttime wind map, the curving Seven. dance, the universe Five. singing prayers in circle after circle. Thank you. I love those rhythms, those back and forth. 
We are moving on back to some of the science. And I know one of the big questions for me every year, and Ron pointed to, is why pi? It's fun to calculate. It's fun to recite. It's fun to definitely, definitely fun to eat pie. Definitely fun to eat food. Um, but where is it applicable? Well, our next guest is one of our teacher institute educators, Lori Lambertson, who has been doing some research into how current scientists today are using Pi. If you're visiting us here at Pier 15, you may have noticed that we have a life-size replica of the one of the Martian rovers. And so we have a whole exhibit about what's going on, some of the investigations of Mars right now. And Lori uh, got to talk to some of those scientists and see how they use Pi. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more about the incredible scientist she's profiled. Please help welcome to the stage, Lori Lambertson. Thanks, Sam. And hi, everybody. Happy Pi Day. I know, and what awesome guests we have today. This has been so amazing. I'm just enjoying the show so much. Now I have to focus. Um, welcome to the Exploratorium. My name is Lori Lambertson, and I am one of the educators here in the Museum's Teacher Institute. March is our favorite month here at the Exploratorium, when we celebrate our own holiday, Pi Day, and honor women in mathematics during Women's History Month. We love mathematics here at the Exploratorium. Mathematics is the language of science. So today's presentation was inspired by Pi, Women's History Month, and the Mars rover being on our floor now, uh, from now until, Mar until May. I had a great experience putting together this talk, reaching out to astronomers and engineers about their work exploring Mars and space, and also asking each of them where and how Pi shows up in their work. They all shared what I'm about to present to you today. Let's meet Mallory Lefland, one of the engineers who helped put the Mars rover Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. Mallory spent five years working on the design and testing of the landing behavior of the Mars rover. Mars rover Perseverance left Earth on July 30th, 2020, and landed on Mars six months later. Imagine how exciting it was for Mallory to watch the entry, descent, and landing from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Southern California. Here's what Mallory had to say about using Pi in her work. During the Mars 2020 landing, the spacecraft deployed a circular parachute at supersonic conditions to slow the spacecraft from 940 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour. The size and shape of the parachute directly influence how much drag it produces, and thus, how much it will slow down the spacecraft. We used pi to calculate the area of the parachute, as well as in the drag calculations. Mallory also says, you'll never believe that you are capable of achieving something if you've never seen someone who looks like you in that role. It's so important that young kids see a diverse group of people working on this mission so they never feel like it is an impossibility. Thanks, Mallory. Dara Norman is an astrophysicist at the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Lab and is also a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion in astronomy. She creates opportunities to bring more people from underrepresented groups and women into what she calls the astronomy enterprise. Dara acknowledges that data access is becoming a prerequisite for telescope access, which is an essential component of an astronomer's research. In addition to advocating for greater data access, Dara wants to make coding and development training widely available across the astronomy workforce, regardless of a person's academic affiliation or career stage. Her research is on black holes in the centers of galaxies, specifically active galactic, galactic nuclei, which are the phenomena of gas and dust falling into a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Why do some galaxies have this activity, while others do not? 
Does the galaxy's environment play a role? Understanding environments means understanding the geometry of the regions a galaxy is sitting in, and anything to do with geometry means pi plays an important role in calculations. Thanks, Dara. Sarah Seeger is an astronomer who's looking for the next Earth among the exoplanets she studies. Exoplanets are planets that or orbit stars other than our sun. NASA confirms that almost 5,000 exoplanets have been discovered so far. Sarah has two main goals, the discovery of an another Earth-like planet and the search for signs of life on exoplanets through understanding their atmospheric compositions and their interior structures. Where does Pi show up in Sarah's work? I use Pi in my work to study exoplanet comp atmospheres. Planets are spherical to the first order, so there are a lot of uses in discovering and studying exoplanets with Pi. She says being a scientist is like being an explorer. You have this immense curiosity, this stubbornness, this resolute will that you will go forward no matter what other people say. Thanks, Sarah. Sunanda Sharma is an astrobiologist that I met when she was here at the Exploratorium talking about her work with the Mars rover. Sunanda is looking for signs of life on Mars. She's interested in the limits of life in extreme environments like those found on Mars. She's also passionate about interdisciplinary science and promoting greater inclusion and understanding across different science fields and audiences. Sunanda uses the rover's Sherlock instrument in her work. Sherlock is an acronym for the Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals. Sherlock uses cameras, spectrometers, and a laser to search for organics and minerals that have been altered by watery environments and may be signs of past microbial life. Sunanda uses Sherlock's spectrometer to study how matter interacts with radiation. Different materials, like minerals or organics, have different spectroscopic signatures that allow us to identify them and can provide evidence for whether life does, or ever did, exist on Mars. Sunanda sent me two ways that Pi shows up in her work. This one's ab about using Pi as a number. Pi is an important number for spectroscopy because we study how waves move. We measure wave number, angular frequency, divided by 2 times pi times the speed of light. We calculate phase, phase shift using pi, and we study polarization using equations that include pi. And she also sent me this quote about where pi shows up in her work. In my work, I search for signs of life on Mars. Aromatic compounds are one of these potential signs and are defined by having pi bonds in resonance that allows for stability. Thanks, Sunanda. Sarah Yerrick's love for the cosmos began in elementary school when she looked to the sky and was fascinated by the moon's features and the sea of stars. Sarah's an engineer who works with a group whose goals are to expand our understanding of terrestrial and extraterrestrial worlds through sample acquisition and handling techniques. So what does that mean? Sarah's job is to manufacture materials that simulate the rocks, sand, and ice found on Mars. These simulated materials are given to other engineers who use them to create the sampling instruments that are integrated into the rovers to take the samples on Mars. Perseverance rover successfully collected samples of Martian rock for the very first time in history last September. All of Sarah's efforts and work were reflected in that historic moment. Sarah reminded me of a great resource that NASA publishes providing problems based on how NASA scientists and engineers use Pi in their work. 
This problem is about calculating the areas of ellipses for Mars rover landing sites. Sarah is learning to speak Quechua, the language of her grandparents and uncles. For Sarah, it's important to connect with her indigenous heritage from Mexico and Peru. She says being able to understand this indigenous language makes it possible to reach a wider audience while keeping her family's culture in her heart. If there's a child who is from the mountains where my grandfather comes from and wants to get to NASA, she has to know it is possible. Thanks, Sarah. Emily Cartarelli is another one of the scientists I met here at the Exploratorium. She's a microbial ecologist and an astrobiogeochemist who's looking for signs of life or habitability on Mars. She uses her interdisciplinary background in molecular biology, geology, and Earth system science to understand life below ground on Earth and search for biosignatures preserved on Mars. Emily studies alluvial environments at sites spanning across the American West. Mars also has alluvial environments. Emily researches, researches how microbes interact within these environments over time and across space using both genomic and geochemical techniques. Emily studies these terrestrial alluvial environments as proxies for the alluvial environments found on Mars. The rounded grains in both of these samples, from Mars on the left and from Earth on the right, occur when wind or water bounce the grains against one another. These grains are too large to have been transported by wind. At this size, scientists know the rounding occurred during water transport. Emily writes, I'm also studying the regolith, or the soil, on Mars, and use pi to evaluate its grain size properties. I'd like to close this presentation with a quote from Emily. I've thought a lot about the value of microbial diversity in my work, which got me thinking about the value of diversity in academia. In the soil and in the world, I have learned that often the more diverse the community is, the more resilient the community is. Thanks, Emily. And thanks to all the scientists and engineers who shared their work and how they use Pi. Thank you all. Happy Pi Day. That was so great, Lori. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm feeling that part of the theme of today is that we need to make sure that the circle that we celebrate are big enough to include everyone. And I love that as another extended metaphor for how we can celebrate Pi and the circle, and that there's someone, some young learner out on the floor today who is enjoying a slice of uh, pecan pie, maybe, and that someday will take their interest to the moon and beyond. Um, now is time to close our program. You've been a wonderful audience. It's been really great spending time with you. And to help us with that, we'll have a closing poem from Sylvia. Um, and before I bring her on, I want to remind you all um, that we will have the pie procession starting at 1.59 p.m. You can line up in gallery four, grab your digit of pie, make the parade route, and get your free slice. We're going to be having a lot of fun celebrating pie for the rest of the day um, with activities from the explainers, a beautiful pie display from Pie Tisserie, a local pie shop who's done amazing work and is really supporting our work this year. And I hope, encourage you all at home to have a great pie day as well. I'll be back for one more brief moment after Sylvia's poem, but please welcome back to the stage, Sylvia Blalock. Thanks again. Um, what comes around doesn't always go around. Sometimes it is standing still and spinning in circles and round and round is relatively stationary. When what comes around has actually been around, its further advancement rests with where it rests. The it and advancement both being you, you see. In its own infinite go-around, where it starts and stops depends on you. 
The beautifully met expectation that is the ratio making it so 3.14 is more about where it comes around that's going around than it is about round. The ratio to be found in those who take the long way round, it is on the road that is taken long, that road that winds and crests and falls, seemingly closing the distance to the moving horizon. In human data, the ratio may be measured in the potential for reflection and curiosity, determination and creativity. It is given of those who choose to see the hallmarks of where they started. And having been apt students come full round the long way, may the human unit of measurement against which this ratio be applied fall into the vista of a world passing us at the speed we choose to leave it. Such quirks and sparks, the lessons learned by coming the long way round, roughly 3.14159265359-ish times more than the more direct road through, to have come full circle. One has to have arrived in a place that once has, one has once been before. Can the energy of a place live wherever it goes, as though just outside those doors, the pink dome of the palace now rises. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, John. Thank you, Science Band. Thank you to the incredible crew who helped support this program and get it out to the air. And for you all, enjoy Pi Day. And let's go out on John Sims' Pi Day anthem. Hit it, Ron. Happy Pi Day. Three.